topics. Um, let's start in the classroom. So this is a classroom from 1982. Uh, it's my classroom, that's me at the back on the right. I was very interested in what the reaction was going to be. Often I present to primary and secondary school teachers and there's this big, ah. <laughs> it was a sort of two out of 10 hour there. It was a bit different crowd. That's fine. Um, <laughs> this, uh, this was my, I was there for 14 years. It was, in, it was a village, small village school in the East Midlands. 300, uh, 300 kids there mixed from all the way through right till I did A-levels. But that was only part of my educational experience. I was also on a television program when I was young for about five years. It was about a boy who turned into a dog called Woof. Uh, and that's me at the back there as well on the right. Um, and, yeah. I don't know where this is going now. This is, I'm thrown. Um, so yeah, and, and my, my surname, as you might have clocked, is Fido. So um, having ginger hair was not the biggest of my problems when I was 10 years old. But anyway, I learned a huge amount from this working in diverse teams with adults, doing multiple drafts of work, take one, take two, take three, and also problem solving. If it rained, you've got to work together to solve that problem, or if the dog's playing up, um, which, it, which often was, um, it was a, a bit of a prima donna, the dog. I mean, the, we had essentially the same part. Look at the difference in the size of the photographs. Um, um, not, it's not a problem, I've moved on, but... Um, <laughs> Anyway, so, but I left school and realized it wasn't just my school. It was a wonderful school in many, many ways, but it was quite narrow. And I was doing this stuff outside of school, which I thought was extraordinary. And I started to wonder why it couldn't happen in the classroom. So right from when I was a kid, I had it in my head, maybe I'll start school one day, maybe when I'm retired. Um, and we'll try and teach some of, that, some of that stuff. And then I realized soon that this is a system-wide problem, and it's possibly getting worse. Um, this is a... P PISA is an organization that does international assessments, and I think in itself it's not a problem, but it tests a very narrow set of skills, and increasingly governments and education secretaries uh, are really worried about it because it sort of says your school's not good enough, your, your system is a 20 out of 25 OECD countries or whatever. So we have a risk that we're starting to focus in an even more narrow way rather than a broader way. But you're at school for two and a half thousand days if you take out all of the weekends. We've got time with young people to do something more than just preparing for exams. So it's not okay to just be focused on these narrow skills. And when I reflected on my time at school, I realized I really didn't do anything of value for anybody else. I created a lot of revision materials for myself, but I didn't do anything of value. I then went to university and I did nothing of value for anybody there either. And then you leave, and all that the world wants from you is work of value. And we wonder why graduates come out and are kind of slightly flummoxed by this. So we started School 21 in 2012. It's in Stratford, which is a disadvantaged part of town. It's ethnically very diverse. It's not socioeconomically diverse. Um, we started with 150 students. We've now got 1,000. We've just opened our sixth form this year. Uh, and I opened it with two teachers, Peter Hyman and Ollie de Botton, who still run the school. And we asked ourselves this question in the, in the run-up to opening the doors, what do we really need to teach? What do young people need? And when you listen to the speakers before, it's, you, you think, wait a minute, this is quite bewildering. What possibly could we teach young people to prepare them for this world? So we tried to take a step back and think about a bit more the sweep of history, what, what has been powerful and useful to know in time. And when you do that, when you take a sort of Weatherby's span of history, 250 years, actually the world has changed Remarkably, in the last 250 years, I actually believe that the first 200 years of those 250, there was greater change than in the last 50, but that, that's just my point of view. I think we've been a bit short-changed in the last 50 years, and peacetime has is, is got a lot to answer for on that front. Um, war's a great innovator. But Robert, Robert Gordon asks, asks this question. He's an American economist. Um, and he says, look, the iPhone is an iconic invention the last 20 years, and we think it's indispensable but would we rather have it than an, an indoor toilet? And you can sort of go through those last 200 years and think, wait a minute, there's so many indispensable things. So may, maybe the world's changing rapidly. And I do believe we're about to face a huge amounts of change. When software's writing software, it's quite hard to understand what that could lead to. But maybe we should look back a little bit more. And also the changes, and the, the, the changes that we face, the crisis that we face that Mark's talking about, we absolutely face, but we've been facing these same crises for 30, 40 years. Anthony Giddens, who's one of our greatest anthropologists, has been talking about ecological threats, the threat of large-scale war, economic polarization, 
um, for 30, 40 years now. This is, these are not new problems. In many ways, our world is changing slowly but profoundly. We still desperately, urgently need to do something about it. So when we did this, we started to think slightly differently about what we taught. We said, one minute, there might be such a thing as 21st century skills, but what about the skills that we think have been useful for a 1,000 years that still aren't taught in schools? And we called these superpowers. They're vitally important. They're still not taught in schools. Here's, here's a, a list that we focus on. It's not the right list or the complete list, but we teach this in School 21. Oracy, which is another word for speaking skills, speaking powerfully in different contexts. Craftsmanship, the ability to redraft. Essentially, at school, you're marked on your first draft every time. You do one draft, it's a B minus, next piece of work. You think, okay, I'm a B minus student. But the real world sends the work back, asks you to do it again better. Grit is about the ability to persevere. Spark, make connections between subjects, which is totally vital. Our education system is hopeless at helping us to do that, but of course, most of these complex problems we face cut across multiple disciplines. And expertise, don't let anyone tell you that we can just Google everything if you don't understand much about a subject, you're pretty bad at Googling it, the cognitive science tells us. We still need to know things in our long-term memory in order to use them creatively. I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of those. Oracy. There was a survey in inner-city schools which showed that, on average, a child says four words in a lesson in an inner-city state school. Four words in a lesson. If you extrapolate that over five years at secondary school, that's two hours of talking over their entire five years at secondary school. They're two hours of talking in the classroom. They're coming in with their speaking skills way below where they need to be. They're not going to catch up. And if we tell students that if they just buckle down and do their exams, they're going to be fine, I think we're selling a lie. So we teach Oracy. Can you teach it? We've been working with Cambridge University over the last few years to try and develop a curriculum and a way of assessing Oracy in different contexts. And we've now got a separate charity called Voice21, which we're rolling out to other schools across the country. Um, and I'm going to give you one example, which is kind of a fun example. But we teach our students in year eight, so they're 12 years old, we teach them how to protest properly because um, I think people are pretty bad at it. And we asked them to pick a humanitarian cause that they care deeply about, or that they just found out about. Um, and they, it is the reality. And then uh, one group I'm going to show you, they, a team of four, they found out that um, a factory had collapsed in Bangladesh and the workers' families hadn't been compensated. And it was owned by Mango, a big retailer. And so they started writing letters to Mango and they weren't satisfied with the response, so they decided to escalate this. So... Um, oh, sorry, and, this, and, this, and this, is, this is in combination with this notion that today matters. Young people can do stuff today that is of value. And this is some young people having impact today. So they went to Oxford Street. This is the flagship store at Mango. That sign says, Mango crossed a red line when they placed profit before lives. Mango weren't very happy about this, by the way. <laughs> as you can imagine. <laughs> Not ideal on a Tuesday morning. Um, but this is, this is timely. This is shortly after the event. They've got a very clear ask. We're asking for compensation for the families. We've also got a very clear hook. We're saying sign our petition. This is a good protest, much better than a lot of the political protests over the last two or three years, which are after the event, not a very clear ask, didn't achieve anything. So I think it's an important skill. We do a lot of project-based learning. About 20 to 25% of what we do in the secondary school is through projects, and we think that gets to a lot of the spark and the grit and oracy skills. And we try and create authentic audiences, real audiences for the work that the students are doing. If you think about... Um, either yourselves or your children have done plays, there's a special sort of energy that you have around the fact you've got to have an authentic audience that are going to be in front of you watching your work. And we try and create that in other areas of the school across other subjects. We do that partly by having exhibitions every term where the community is invited in and the students explain about the things that they've been learning. Um, and their work might entertain the, um, or educate the community. Slightly chaotic sometimes. Here's some students kind of um, talking about their work. Other students can look at each other's work, learn about what the other people have been learning. The community's learning. The teachers are there. This is one example. Some of you may have been to Punch Drunk Theatre, where you go, you put on a, a white mask, and you're then immersed in a new world. Well, our history and drama teacher decided it was a good idea to do this with the students. And so these 13-year-olds, this is the Russian Revolution. They devised an immersive play about the Russian Revolution. The audience, you can just about see there the guys wearing a white mask. Um, best ideas are copied. And then we, the audience came in and moved through this world and learned about the Russian Revolution. Um, it's a very, very different way of learning history. Now, there's a trade-off because that takes a lot of time to do. So you might cover just the Re Russian Revolution, not all the other revolutions. But our bet is that this stays with them and then they're able to hook in other knowledge to that. 
Uh, here's a kind of fun example. This is science and art. And the idea here is that the students have to use different surfaces to teach about friction. They have to introduce motion to learn about torque and, and forces. And again, exhibition night, people are using it. Uh, mini golf. Is this a good example of a project? I'm not sure. Um, I've, I've asked some questions about this one. But that's the point. The conversation that happens after this project is, did they learn deeply about science? Was science really critical to the mini golf course? Is there a project that we can do that still has an authentic audience that uses torque and um, moments and acceleration and friction and in a better way? The other reason I use it is because this is funny. Um, <laughs> the, the, <laughs> you go through there, it goes through his mouth and can knock his wall over. Um, <laughs> craftsmanship. Um, craftsmanship. This is a, you can probably tell actually, this is a self-portrait by Brian. He's dressed as a Tudor king. Um, that's his first draft. Now, you can, put that on the, you can put that on the fridge. What we do, um, and again, not every time because this takes time, but what we, this is, he's, he was in reception. I think he was four. He might have been five. We ask him to reflect on it. We ask his friends to reflect on it, and the teacher gives him feedback as well. And that, teacher, that, that feedback has to be helpful, specific, and kind, which we could all live by that. It's, it's, a, good, uh, it's a good model. Now, the feedback's pretty straightforward. Like, the face isn't big enough. You're not using enough of the paper. You've forgotten the crown. Where's the mouth, you know, or the shoulders or the body? Um, but the point being, he then has another go, and he thinks, wait a minute, people are going to be looking at this um, and giving me feedback. That's his second draft. That was really good. And the, the, <laughs> the, the uh, yeah, Brian, second draft. And, the, and then there's multiple more drafts he does. I'm going to show you his final draft. And by that point... It's, he's learning a lot of techniques about the color of the background. He's been told to, to have more detail on the crown. Um, but the point being, if you remember that first draft and what grade you've given that, this was his final draft. It's just a whole different ball game. And this child now thinks, wait a minute, I'm good at art, but it might take six, seven, eight, nine drafts to get to this. That's the first draft, second draft, third draft, first draft, second draft, third draft. He's not like a freak student. Um, so these are five... If you, they're kind of analog skills, really. They're, they're, they're timeless superpowers that we think is important to teach in school, but they're not being taught, but they can be. Is there a cost to exam performance? Well, we had our first set of GCSE results last year, um, and the, initially we were told that this number was top 5%. It's actually top 6%, So I said because that got updated in a few months later. We were in the top 6% in the UK for academic progress. That's the measure of when they come in at 11, where they're expected to get to by the time they do their GCSEs. And we're also in the top 8% just in terms of attainment in the tough subjects, in the EBAC subjects. And this is in a very disadvantaged part of town, and we spent a lot of time with them making mini golf courses. So we were pretty pleased with this. So they, it worked. They did really well in their exams. And I suppose the point here is we're trying to get students to act on the world. We talked about acting right at the beginning. Um, if you, don't look it up, but if you do Google the video of that program I was in, you could question me on the Trade Description Act in terms of acting. But anyway, acting on the world, I think, is more important than adapting to the world. We need young people that can shape the world they want to live in or create the future that they want to live in. And I think we need to change the education system in order to do that. Thanks,